All right, here we go. Doing this again, I see. Good morning, everybody. Well, right now it says one concurrent viewer. I think there's more than that up there. Um, good morning, I hope you had a great weekend. I know it's Tuesday, but it still feels like a weekend to me. Um, it's been a... Uh, hey, what's up, Rosa? It's Bella. Good morning, good morning. I hope you all are well. Uh, I'm getting ready to answer some of these questions that you all put on me. Mariana, good morning. Um, I like to live stream. I think next semester I might try something a little bit different, but you all have been, Nicole, good morning. You all have been absolutely fantastic this whole semester, and I have a couple surprises coming your way, um, but I need to think them through for a couple days, and I'll let you know on the uh, announcement board probably by Friday. You can expect a lot of your grades to be uh, back to you by Sunday. As a matter of fact, I plan on having everything done by then so that you uh, will know exactly where you stand. Um, I wouldn't worry about it too much as long as you're submitting to sean.hopeworks at gmail.com or within Blackboard. Now, I know, oh, hey, Emily. Uh, I noticed that some of, not maybe not you, right? I noticed that a lot of people, Andrea, good morning. I noticed that uh, people were submitting it to my faculty email, and that's an absolute no-no because I don't check my faculty email during the summer. Um, that's why I gave very specific um, email instructions. However, I will check it because uh, I can't let anybody not get credit for the work that they submitted. But for now, I remember Sean dot hope or hey law um, dot hope works at gmail dot com or within Blackboard. Either way, well, the camera's all over the place. I'm not very good at this. <laughs> this Alejandro, good morning. Um, while I'm talking, since at least for the moment. The uh, chat board is working. Raina, good morning. Since the chat board is working, you know, I get, uh, you can submit questions now. I'd rather ask, answer questions in real time, although I have to say, I have pages and pages of questions that you ask. Some of, your, some of your questions, man, golly, some of them are were tough. Some of them would be tough to answer. And so, um, man, I don't know, some of you brought me down to my knees, baby, and, uh, you know, I have to, hey, Law. I have to, um, you know, kind of work through this stuff. And I know that, you know, since I wrote the book, Dear Mama, that it apparently would seem that it's really easy to answer these questions. But I have to tell you that um, it, there's nothing easy about it. Good morning, Jessica. Um, it, is, it is an excruciatingly painful thing at times to talk about. And I'm glad I have these glasses on with the light reflecting off them so you can't see my eyes swell up with the camera being right in front of my face. You'd be like, oh, he's crying again. Well, some of this stuff was kind of tough. So why don't we go ahead and do it that way. Um, I'm going to tie it into social environment. Everything we talk about will be tied into social environment. Uh, because obviously, the social environment, as far as Dear Mama goes, was uh, pretty significant. Good morning, Ashley. Um, so why doesn't somebody go ahead and lead me off with a question that you may want me to answer? Um, I hope you've been reading the book. Um, some of you have said in your email comments to me that is very intense and you know it is a very intense book it was a very angelica good morning it was a very intense experience if you want to if you want if you want to know the truth so um someone lead us off with a question hey kayla good morning every time i do this is because even with glasses on i can't see what's going on so i get up close to the screen so i can see um what your name is emily hey emily how are you good morning Oh man, I'm feeling I'm feeling kind of pumped up this week. Uh, I wrote that uh, that paper, and it was uh, it ended up being 117 pages long. It was I think I wrote somewhere like 90 pages in the last three days, maybe 80 pages in the last three days. Whew. Tell you what, when I finally finished, I had to do some cleaning up and editing on it on Saturday. But I will tell you that. At the end of the day, man, that was that was rough. It took it out of me. So I took Sunday off. I missed. Uh, I didn't. I couldn't even get to my text to check and see what your questions were. So I apologize if um, if I missed any of your requests or uh, you got kind of buried away or what have you. But uh, I do apologize. Uh, I will be making it up to you. And can you believe this? We are in the Tuesday of the fourth week. So after today, we don't we don't have a live stream on Thursday. So what I'm going to do is over the next few days, I'm going to actually do an investment 
video and I'm trying to think of how to put my little face up in the corner while you know the video goes through I don't know how to do all that stuff but um, I think that investing or learning how to take care of your financial house is really important especially at your youthful age because you know when we take a look at social environment one of the things that continues to play out as far as I'm concerned when I look at the news I don't watch the news when I, when I hear about the news when I do see things on social media when I hear people talking it almost seems to me most problems at least if they don't revolve around it, they start with our economic financial stability. And so if things deal with our financial stability, if financial stability is really the core to our peace and our happiness, and it doesn't mean everything, Isabel, good morning, um, it, money doesn't buy you happiness, that's for darn sure, because I make a lot more money than I ever thought I would, and I'm, uh, even though I'm happy, I was happier back when I was in college only making about hundred fifty dollars a month and so you know we take a look at money and what it does uh, the pursuit of money in and of itself isn't going to buy you happiness however um, it does make it easier when you're not stressed out trying to decide what what you're going to purchase or if you can purchase something uh, and when you have kids do I buy this for my kids do I buy that here comes Christmas I was just reading a thing on um, whether or not they're going to have college football but the introduction to this um, discussion was remember when you're a kid and you wanted a bike and you you asked for a, a Schwinn and next thing you know your your parents bought you a, a Huffy you were disappointed well thinking about all that kind of stuff when you do become a parent you have to make those decisions right private school not private school um, public school do you buy the $160 Air Nike so that they can fit in or do you buy something and pay less you know so the decisions that you make I really got it. Good morning, Kevin. Um, the decisions that you make really are guided by um, finances. So one of the things I want to do for next week, I, I think is urgently important, is I will teach you how to build your financial house so that when you're my age, which is 54, you're going to be sitting in a place where you say, man, that crazy professor back in the day, he was right. And if you follow the steps, oh, I didn't see you up there. Uh, uh, Danny, Dan, Danny Malls? Danny Moss? All right. Anyhow, uh, sorry for missing you. Uh, but in any case, <clears throat> if there aren't any questions, then I guess I'll just go ahead and start answering some of the questions. So, like I said, <clears throat> there were, I'm looking here, she's maybe 150 questions that you all asked. And some of you asked me some questions. I'm like, are you serious? That's a tough one. Well, let me go ahead and start with um, where the idea of the book came from. And I don't know how many of you um, know or remember Maya Angelou, but you know it was completely an accident that this book ever was introduced as a potential. Oh, boom! Emily, coming through. How did be, being raised by a group of strong women affect your outlook on for future relationships with other people? You know, <clears throat> that is Emily. God, no one asked that question. Uh, that's a fantastic question. If you put into this idea that social environment right are the institutions that surround us well there are other there are other uh, social demographic factors that impact our lives for example uh, good morning Sarah one of the things that you just brought up is how does gender affect our lives and I quite honestly um, the one thing that is absolutely true Emily is I, I call them the three queens my mom Irma Jean and Mama Green and yeah I, I consider my mom a queen and it was a very complicated relationship that I had with her. But man, my mother was strong now. Don't 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 misunderstand um, that she was four foot ten. Irma Jean, oh geez, she was she was strong and forget about it. None of them compared to Mama Green. Mama Green was strong mentally, she was strong physically, and she had a strong presence. And me <laughs> what's kinda of funny is I, I grew up to be, you know, relatively normal guy. I'm five foot ten. You know, I weigh about 184 pounds, 180, 184 pounds. You know, I'm in pretty good shape, uh, relatively good shape. Especially for my age, I'm probably in great shape. Um, to be a little bit better muscular, but I wasn't good and muscular when I was young. But when I was young, I was literally the run of the neighborhood. I was far and away the smallest kid out there. I mean, <laughs> you know, when I graduated eighth grade or eighth grade to go into high school, I was four foot nine. My mother was four ten. And, but I was a tremendous athlete, 
but I was so tiny in stature. And my mother, who was tiny, um, she was very petite. She probably 9,500 pounds, four foot ten. Well, I'll tell you what, she would clock you. And I've seen all three of them get in like fights. And my mother was not the type to back down to anybody uh, at any time. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I had broke my leg, my leg, the breaking of my leg was just a, it was a major turning point. You know, and I'm coming to you, don't worry Emily, this is how I answer questions. Good morning Samuel. Um, I, I go all over the place just to bring it back. Um, you know, if, if we're going to look at social environment, one of the things I do in my live classes is I talk about the difference between a, uh, a turning point and a crossroads. Right? A turning point is something that happens to you. A crossroads is where you have to make a decision, a life-changing decision that's going to change the direction of your life. Marriage, life-changing decision. Where you go to college, a life-changing decision. Do you move to California when you're 25? All these things are life-changing. Do you take this job or do you take that job? When I took the job, the teaching assistantship at Ohio State, which was a great thing, I turned down a job working in public relations for the Philadelphia 76ers, and I was a huge sports fan. Right? So when I turned that job down, it 100% changed the trajectory of my life. I probably have still been in there. Good morning, everybody, as you come in, Albany. And I'm going to answer this question in a second. So I grew up being surrounded by sports, and sports really was my avenue out. Sports and humor were the things that carried me um, through some of the more difficult periods. So in, I, I can tell you the date. It was June, oh my gosh, it's almost to the day, June 14, 1980. I'm going back on a fly ball. I was an all-star second baseman at the time. We were just two years removed from being predicted to go to the Little League World Series in Williamstown. We had a phenomenal team. And as I'm running back on the ball, I jump up to catch it like this. I caught it. The ball landed in my mid, and I caught it. But our center fielder, Mike, dove to make a diving catch out of center field. And I called for it. And, but he just didn't hear me, you know. I said, I got it, I got it, I got it. And, and as a second baseman, you're supposed to go to the ball unless you get called off by the outfielder. And I didn't hear him. He didn't say anything. So obviously he didn't think I could make the play. So he went at a full head. And he dove into the side of my knee. And my knee went <coughs> like this. And I was in the outfield. And I'm like, oh, my God. And, and, and I refused to cry. Now, see, that's where gender was really interesting back in the 70s because... It was, little boys were just not allowed to cry. And for me, and this really this haunts me, although, you know, I cry every day now watching freaking uh, my, my Hero Academy. Every day, Deku has me crying. I, I even cried about All Might yesterday. I'm like, what? Are you serious? But anyhow, so back then, we weren't allowed to cry. And as a matter of fact, I got caught crying one time because um, I'd been in a fight with one of my friends, and my mother spanked me for crying. And at that point, I was like, no, nah, man, I'm not going to cry. So when I broke my leg, it was, I mean, it was a horrific, it was a, a life-changing injury. I mean, I still have arthritis from it. I still walk with a limp. And it's all because of this instantaneous, this moment. So what happened was when Mike dove into my knee and snapped it, I got up and walked on it. And back then, they would always say, shake it off, shake it off, shake it off, shake it off. And I had a little splinter in the bone. And as I shook it off, it was just slicing my knee up, right? Slicing my knee, slicing my knee. And all the ligaments in the interior of my leg were shredded. The um, meniscus in the middle was destroyed. And so they had to remove the meniscus, which is why I have arthritis now. But it destroyed everything, all the tendons and ligaments in my leg. And when I got to the hospital, um, which was a horrible trip, because <laughs> the tax rate is so low in East Toledo, that there's so many potholes. Every time they hit a bump, it felt like I was getting stabbed in the leg. And I refused to cry. I was screaming in pain. And I went by my house. My mom wasn't there. She said, go to the hospital. My mother was an orthopedic specialist. She's a head nurse. And um, the doctor comes in. His name was Iqbal Singh. Well, he didn't come in that day. He came in on Monday. That was a Saturday. And they wanted to do immediate surgery. My mother refused it until Dr. Singh came back. Dr. Singh at the time, at that moment, was at the Vatican performing an operation on one of the, the bishops, uh, performing a back operation. He was world-renowned, so my mother waited until he came back, and they were fearful that it was going to cause more damage, and she said, no, I'm waiting for him. But anyhow, this guy was mean. 
and everyone was afraid of him. He was a fantastic surgeon, off the chart doctor, always loved me, called me chief. Hey chief, you know, hey chief, how you feeling chief? I'm, I'm good, Dr. Singh. And one day he got my mom's face, and she was a head nurse, and everyone's watching. She took her little finger and put it right up to him and said, don't you ever talk to me or my nurses that way again because you don't know who you're messing with. So she stands up to the most dictatorial doctor in the whole place. And when she did, he said, Susie, you're right. And she never once again had any issues with him. And one of the worst spankings I ever got was, <laughs> when I was four years old, I'm riding my tricycle down the street, and this kid hit me in the nose with the ceiling tile that had fallen off the roof of the house. So I go running in the house. I said, hey, Mom, Mom, Mom. I'm crying. What's wrong with you? I said, the boy down the street hit me in the nose with a ceiling tile, and I fell in the mud puddle. She said, did you beat his ass? I'm like, no, I came to get you to beat his ass. <laughs> little. And she said, you get out there and beat his ass, and if you don't, I'm going to whoop you. I said, I'm not going to beat him up. He's a bully. Whew. She tore me up, and she said, let me tell you something. Cause we, remember, we lived in a really rough neighborhood, or at least a rough area of town. And she says to me, she says, look, if you can't stand up for yourself, why should anybody else stand up for you? And I was like, what? She said, if you can't stand up for yourself, why should anyone else stand up for you? So I said, okay. And I beat the hell out of Tommy the next day, man. Boom, boom, me and Jerry Berry are chasing him around. So Jerry, oh, Jerry Berry was my neighbor. My, oh, my God. No. Jerry Berry and I, you know, there was a movie that was on back in the early 1970s. <laughs> and this old lady gets pushed down a flight of stairs and she's in a wheelchair and she bounces and <laughs> she hits the bottom and she it's a movie okay I'm not laughing because the old lady died but she dies in the movie so I look over at Jerry Berry and I say you know what man I said we got a problem here he goes what is it I go we got a package rolling downstairs man because you never know if someone's gonna push you down the stairs he's like what I said we gotta come on man so we start rolling down the stairs for like three or four hours we're rolling and rolling 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 and you get to the bottom, and you hit the wall, and you get back up, and you go to the top, and he rolls, and I roll. His mom comes in. Her name is Joe. And Joe comes in, and she goes, what the hell are you guys doing? I said, Joe, you never know if you're going to get pushed down some stairs, so we got to practice. Sure enough, on my 23rd birthday, a guy named Vince, and when I was at graduate school, he pushed me down a flight of stairs. We were play fighting and stuff. And I said, man, we can't play fight here. So I might fall down the stairs. He said, yeah, like you. And he pushes me. I go rolling down the stairs. Now, the amazing part was, is that when I was rolling down the, the stairs, I had my blood bite in my hand. Not one drop spilled. Not one drop! And I hit the, I hit a rubber plant just before I went flying out the window from the second store I'd been smashed. I hit the plant and rolled down some more stairs. I got to the bottom. <laughs> and when I got to the bottom, Ramiro, who was a professor at FIU, Ramiro Martinez, he said, what are you, some tough guy? Because I had a gash over my head. So he came up and smacked me. Yeah, <laughs> What are you doing? So anyhow, as it turns out, that practice of rolling down the stairs when I was four actually helped me when I was much older. I, you know, I was able to roll down the stairs and uh, hit the plant and didn't go out the window and then got smacked around a little bit, which was mm, ironic. But in any case, so we started practicing rolling down these stairs. And what was happening was I was becoming tougher and tougher to pain. I wasn't, you know, it didn't hurt. And we used to have these guys put us in a trash can at the playground and they'd roll us around in the trash can, and then they'd roll us down the stairs into a tree. <laughs> so, uh, okay, that's just dumb. But anyhow, uh, what was happening though, I was getting tougher and tougher, and pain was less and less. I mean, you could punch me and beat me up or whatever, and I just didn't, I just didn't absorb the pain. And the reason was is because it was more painful having my mother beat me than it was having anything else take place. So my fear for her uh, actually eliminated my emotional attachment to my pain. So anyhow, getting back to the story. So we get to the hospital, and I refused to cry until um, the doctor told me I'd never walk again without a cane. And at that moment, I realized that my dreams were gone. All that practice to become a professional baseball player, all those hours of hitting a ball, or not hitting a ball, hitting a stone with a broom handle so I could get better eye-hand coordination when I was swinging, and all that practice so I wouldn't make an error eight hours a day trying to get 25, uh, no, not 25, 100, um, field 100 grounders without making an error. Man, all those years of practice, 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 
gone in an instant. When he told me I'd never walk again, told me I'd certainly never play sports, he, um, that's when I cried. And the, the tears just rolled down my face. But what was happening was, on the one hand, um, I was certainly become very capable of handling pain, right? Physical and mental. But at the same time, it was really helping me detach from myself. And it was that detachment that really had an impact. Mama Green, her, her saying was, you never start a fight, but you make sure you end it. And Irma Jean was, you know, you, you stand up for yourself, boy, because if you don't, they will take advantage of you. So these three tough women taught me how to be extremely tough. I was, I, I, I could have emotions, but I was very emotionally detached. So the strength of the three women actually helped me persevere through all kinds of stuff, man. You know, uh, people calling me names, people pushing me around, people fighting me. I was never, I was never one to back down from a fight, even though I knew I was going to lose because I was so tiny. And you knew you were going to get hit, right? And so on that, on that end, they gave me this ferocious tenacity to stand up for myself. So as far as like becoming a, a doctor, it was that constant practice, 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 that ability to sit down, focus, and be in tune with what I'm doing. But it's also that mental toughness because there's always a threat in my life in our neighborhood and stuff like that. So as long as there was a threat, I had to have mental toughness. And at this point in time, for example, one of the things that has really had an impact is that I'm, I'm fearless basically to anything because I know that there's nothing that will compare to my mother trying to whack me when I was 15 years old versus what I'm going to face now, right? Because I have control and power in my life now. Here's your question, Emily, and this is a really good question. Because Irma Jean was so puritanical when it came to relationships. Irma Jean was like, do not touch a girl, do not have sex with a girl, do not let her touch you, do not date anybody, because if you do and she gets pregnant, all of your dreams are going to be destroyed. So do not under any circumstance. I kissed Lisa once in front of the tree in front of my house. She chased Lisa off and uh, went, thank you, Jessica. And when she chased Lisa off, she said, boy, get your ass in this house. Didn't I tell you not to be kissing girls? I'm like, yeah, Gene. And Gene was 5'6", 350 pounds. And I'm just, you know, I'm just a little dude. And so I said, okay, okay. So, I mean, I, I didn't talk to girls on the phone. I didn't go ask them. I didn't date them. Now, the sad part was back in those days, I was a cute little kid. I had all this hair. And, you know, I had a square jaw and all that kind of stuff, and I was always getting asked out. And, you know, it was a very promiscuous time, the 1970s, so I'm always getting all kinds of offers. You know, the first time I was offered a sexual relationship, I was 8 years old, and the girl was 16 or 17 years old, and of course I told her no. I mean, are you serious? It was 1973, so I was 7. I was 7. And I said, no, nah, no. Nah. You know, I'm not, I can't do that. And then, um, but it became constant because I was this cute little athletic guy that everyone was like, oh, you're so cute. And, but I have Irma Jean back in my head saying, don't you dare. Which was actually a good thing because it kept me out of some trouble up at the playground and up in the neighborhood. But on the other hand, it detached me. So here it goes, Emily. So on the one hand, I was emotionally ridiculously strong, right? And still am. I still am. I mean, even in my dark days, boy, it's like it's like all my fighting through. And Deku was just saying, I can, I can do this no matter what. And you're not going to stop me. And when I have that attitude, I am unstoppable. I mean, how do you write 120 pages in four days if you can't just sit down and say, let's go do this, right? But the problem was, and this is where it's really tricky. This is where it's really tricky. And I still have to deal with this is that I never wanted to date anybody. I just didn't want to have a girlfriend because um, I knew that between my mother's detachment and all these messages that were in my head about the nature of relationships, I just couldn't do it. <clears throat> and when I did do it, I was always very romantic and I was always very caring and giving. If you wanted to go to shopping, we're going shopping. If you want to buy a house, I'll buy you a house. But there's always this wall right this emotional wall that I couldn't quite overcome and it wasn't that I wasn't loving and all those kind of things but everybody who was with me knew that there was stuff in my head that they couldn't get to and 
what happened was because things were so rough is I had learned to put a mask on my face, right? Irving Goffman's notion of the mask. And which means basically, if you're looking at life from a symbolic interactionist perspective, we all do it, you do it. We protect ourselves by wearing a mask. We protect our virtual identity so that no one can hurt our actual, you know, our authentic self. So the virtual self is always here protecting the authentic self. <clears throat> and I've been hurt so many times that my mask became very strong. And my mask wasn't one of these masks where I'm walking around like this and I'm going to pop you in your face. My mask was, I'm going to make you laugh. And I can make anybody laugh. I can't make you laugh here, but, you know, I'm talking to a freaking screen by myself. But I can make people laugh. And the other thing I could do is I could dunk a basketball. So people would come from all over to watch me play because my jumper was smooth. I could just, I could fly. I was pinning shots up on the backboard after I'd healed my leg. So I had this ferocious athletic drive and I hid my I hid behind athletics and I hid behind humor as a way to cope because I couldn't hide behind dating women so as I've gotten older one of the things that continues to haunt me is that you know, like if I get upset I bury it but it always comes out later so I've had to like with my well, I don't know if she's my current girlfriend I don't know what we are right now but the one thing that keeps breaking us down is that my strength to be strong instead of communicate these feelings have been the things that end up damaging. Because then when, here's what happened. So when I was in college, so we're not even talking about Mama Green right now. When I was in college, I was so non-dating, right? But in college, I don't know. There's freaking YouTube. Now it's like not working. But in any case, um, I was so anti-dating, but everyone was questioning, why aren't you sleeping around and doing all this kind of stuff? And I was like, I don't want to, man. I just want to get some good grades. I said, you know, you're smart, you're funny, you can dance, you can do this, you're a handsome guy, all this kind of stuff. You talk well, you get along, you, you write poetry. Why aren't you doing this, this, and this? And I'm like, because I don't want to. And then one of my friends, one of my real close friends, he goes, what was wrong with you, man? If I were you, I'd be doing this, this, and this. I said, man, that's not me, but... My stepfather, when I was in high school, because I wouldn't date, my, my stepbrother could date anybody. You know, he's six foot three, blue eyes, curly blonde hair. Man, I, girls loved him. My stepsister was dating and stuff like that. And then me, um, I wouldn't bring anyone to the house. I wasn't dating anybody. I refused to because Irma Jean's voice is in my head. And so what happened was is my ability to have relationships was always challenged. My first two lives didn't have a chance because I would not let them get into the temple. They couldn't, like, affect my emotional grasp here. I was very kind. I took care of everything. Um, but with the new one, um, what I had to do is really try to uh, be in contact with her emotionally. And I've worked on her not much better. So, Emily, being with the strong women was both a blessing and a curse. Because as far as being blessed, they gave me, oh, God, they gave me so much strength. And the other thing that Mama Green did, and this is where... Mama Green was so vitally important in my life. The thing that Mama Green did was she built up my esteem. She made me believe that I was really worthy of things. You know, uh, she knew she knew that other kids had more had more money than I did. Um, she knew that we were poor, but she used to say, "You know what? Just because we don't have the money they have doesn't mean they're any happier than you are. Just because we don't have as much money as they do." doesn't mean that you're not as loved as they are. So just remember, right? You have love and you have family. Never forget that. I said, oh, okay. Okay, I get that. You, Emily, it's really hard to unlearn those things. Defense mechanisms. And then, oh, what I was going to say is, so at Denison, for me to be able to engage with women, I had to start drinking. Because drinking is the very thing that turned off all the messages. But to turn those messages off took so much drinking that it became a problem. And then if you read semicolon, you can see what a big problem it became because at first, man, I just had fun. And, and when I drink, I'm a really fun dude. As a matter of fact, <laughs> I'm about as fun as you're ever going to meet somebody because you don't know. People would hang out with me just to see what the hell is going to happen tonight because you just never know. And so for me to turn off all those negative scripts that I had learned and all those images, I had to drink. And so... That's where my problem became, is not is how do you manage the drinking so that you can overcome all the other stuff. And, you know, right now, from 
for a while, starting around 2016, I really started to realize I have to drive forward, um, quitting the drinking, but understanding that uh, there's all these dynamics. So the reason I wrote Dear Mama, by the way, was to unravel the dynamics. I didn't write that book because it was fun, believe that. I mean, you can read it. There, there's nothing fun in there for me. I, I can't tell you that. I had gone years without crying. I think since ni since she died in 1993, prior to this year, watching all, you know, My Hero Academia, I cried in 2014 once. I cried when my mom died in 2014. I cried once in, well, I cried in 1993. Uh, I cried watching Wreck-It Ralph in 2012. <laughs> and that's about it. You know, nothing. So in 24 years, 21 years, I cried three times. Now I cry every day because what I realize is, is that the crying is a really release of beautiful emotions, right? You should laugh, you should cry, you should get upset, you should be relieved, all these kind of things. And I've allowed myself to experience this full range of emotion. And in doing so, I don't have these scripts running through my head. And so unraveling the scripts was the reason why I wrote that book. So I knew that I could never be fully me, even though I'm a great teacher in real life, and I'm compassionate, I'm a compassionate human being, I'm good to my ex-wife, I'm good to the, my first ex-wife, I'm good to my girlfriend, I mean, I'm a really good person to my to the people I'm with if I have a girlfriend. However, you know, there's a lot of complications, so I just decided I'm going to fix it. And I've been fixing it, I work on it, I got my little journal every day, I sit down, I read the Bible for half hour, then I read some Napoleon Hill or somebody, and then I write my journal and I have all my stuff, the 50 day challenges in effect. I really literally started yesterday. And all this is because of the dedication that I learned from, uh, from Mama Green. But what she did was she built that esteem up because without her, I'd have, I'd have been crushed so many times. And instead of being crushed, when things got broken, I could sit back and look at it and say, okay, like for example, I have a sign up here that says hope works. It says, first thing is forgive yourself. Because we make mistakes. My God, I've been I've done some mean things to people and I'm like, oh my God, I forgive myself first, then I apologize. So forgive yourself, find your mistake, then it says, uh, determine to change, and then commit to a better direction. That's what I have mastered. When I break something, I do something wrong, I say, okay, what did I do wrong? What was the problem with my thinking? Then I commit to making it better, making a change. <clears throat> and then I go in that direction. That's really Mama Green. Mama Green really was, okay, baby, if you want to be a professional baseball player, then this is what you got to do. You got to do this, 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 and this. You got to practice, practice, practice. Here's how you should practice. She played in a women's league back in the 1920s, a professional uh, black women's league. Um, and her husband, Freddie Bennett, Herman Jean's dad, he actually played in the Negro Leagues and was a great home run hitter. He was, you know, nationally known. He played against Satchel Paige and Josh Gibson and all those guys. Um, so he was phenomenal. But in any case, um, you know, I, I always knew that life was a process. Now my mother, she, her, her greatest attribute to me was, is that always be a lifelong learner because, you know, your intelligence will carry you very far. So be smart, read, um, think. Think for yourself. That was beauty. Think for yourself. Don't ever follow the pack. Follow what you know. And allow your heart, lead with your heart. Follow uh, when they don't work. Okay. I guess we're reconnected. Alright, here it comes. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Okay, you're coming back in. Oh, brother, that's, that's the one thing. It, it, I, we live in 2020, man. This kind of technical difficulty shouldn't be a part of it. But in any case, okay. So the reason I put it there is when she fires and shoots him in the back three times and he falls into the driveway and she escapes, right? And then she drops that gun and she's standing there like this, big, this statuesque. Because she lived, when my mother was going to have an abortion or have a adoption of me, Mama Green interceded and said, I'll raise your baby. And when she made the decision to raise me as her own child, right, it gave me life. And in giving me life, what it allowed me to do is be the teacher of almost 20,000 students at this point, right? 
So the fact that now I've had 20,000 students, the way I look at it is, you know, violence is a horrible thing. It, it, I mean, I never wish any of you a violent experience. Nothing like this. And mine wasn't terrible. It's was bad at times, but I've seen worse. Um, but here's the thing. From her violence in self-defense from her stepfather who was going to kill her, 30, 30 some years passed by, 35 years passed by from that moment, it uh, wasn't that many, it was uh, about 30 years passed by, and there's a woman who doesn't know what to do because she can't afford to have a baby, she's broke, she's living in a pizza parlor, in the basement of a pizza parlor in a storage room, <clears throat> and now she's pregnant, right? She knows she's emotionally detached, she doesn't know how to care, and she doesn't want me. And all the way through my life, my childhood life, she battled herself to be a parent, but she also battled to have her own life, and she, the feeling that she didn't want me was verified from other sources later. Uh, even more recently, I was verified that she didn't want me. So, you know, that's something I've had to deal with, but Mama Green did. And so, if she doesn't shoot her stepfather and she gets killed, Sean's not here. So the way I look at it is, and this is really important, Albany, because the way I look at darkness, because that's really dark. When you're talking about people trying to kill each other, that's, that's about the ultimate darkness, right? Or kill oneself. In that darkest moment, what I learned was, is that there's always a light, right? In the darkest night, you can't see the stars. Or, I mean, in the, in the brightest day, you can't see the stars. But in the darkest night, you can see a star. And what do they tell you to do in your life? Shoot for the stars. They don't say shoot for the sun, which is a star, but they say shoot for the stars. How can you shoot for something that you can't see if it's in the light? So the way I've always learned is, even from your darkest day, there is light. Even when all is lost, there is hope. And as long as you can have light, and as long as you can have hope, you always have a foundation from which to build. So phenomenologically, all those events that happened way back in the 1910s and the 1920s to Bertha, all the things that happened to my mom in the 1940s and 1950s at the hand of my grandmother. All those things converge in a very unique alignment, bringing me into this world. And through me, I've been able to take their messages and help countless numbers of students. And the fact that even when I've had dark periods, I've had them. I mean, it's hard to deal with this stuff. <laughs> you know, I have PTSD from being attacked in the middle of the night when I was asleep and not being able to get up. You can read that in the, the morning the childhood ended. You know, that's the morning where my mom had tried to off me. And so when, when, I, when you think about that and think about being knocked unconscious, being beat up, uh, attempted sodomy up at, the, at, up at the factory, having been sexually molested, you start adding these things up. And next thing you know, you're, it's hard to fight off the dark. But I had the self-esteem that Bertha had given me. And with that self-esteem, I was able to stand up. Um, and being able to stand up means there's always hope for a better day. There's always hope for a better day. You might have to dust off. You might be laying on the ground back up. Like Les Brown says, if, if, you're, if you can see up, you can get up. And I always believe that as long as there's hope, there's always a way to find the solutions to your answers. And it stems from that moment in history. So the reason that's the opening part of the book, and she cursed. I mean, I put it out there. <laughs> I didn't hold anything back as far as the realism of what's in the book. And so it starts there because without that I'm not alive and if I'm not alive someone else is teaching this class you'll be in it but someone, is, someone else is teaching it and my impact is unique because I blend together storytelling with concepts right so if we're turning back to social environment social environment is built upon historical context right so the his history of all those events that led up to me have a meaning and I carry with me it's like my mother used to say you know the present doesn't exist because what the present is is the future and the past converging in one point in time right so time in and of itself doesn't exist either and what happens is all those experiences from all our ancestors in the past can create who we are we may not know it we don't can't verify it but all those things that we do affects the people that we meet in the future so every incident is a convergence in time and space of the past and the pre and in the future in the present moment. The present moment never exists because it's always in the past. So essentially, phenomenologically, all those things that happen to her are the reason why I can teach, right? 
And now that I'm moving more towards motivational speaking, um, those motivations come from a dark place. That's why I call it Hope from a Place of Darkness. That's the name of my tour, Hope from a Place of Darkness. Because I've been in dark places, but I continue to stand up and rise, and I try to use the pains that I've had so that you can use them to either latch on to or modify your life. And I've had, I had some of you say, you know, I was in a domestic violence situation, and, you know, people blame you, and they don't understand the dynamics, but because you are able to share with me, I feel much better, and I can move on, and I can do this. That happens to me all the time. You, you can't even imagine how many people, you know, privately come up to me and say, hey, you know, you saved my life. I had, I've had 10 people in the last four years here at MDC who are ready to commit suicide that came to me and said, hey, can you help me? And I did, of course. I'm not allowed to. Uh, I'm allowed to, but I'm not allowed to. I'm not certified to give advice, but the way I look at it is, People say it's a liability issue. Man, eh, there's your liability issue, Jack. Because the way I look at it is, I'd rather I'd rather create a liability issue and save your life than to worry about the rules and the laws and the regulations. Because I'm not a rule player. I don't follow the rules. And that is because three three queens gave me strength to stand on my own. And if you come at me, I'm smart enough to stand on my own. I could have went to law school. I just didn't want. I just wasn't in the mood. Okay, Ashley, here we go. Were you, were you friends with Maya Angelou? I wasn't friends, okay? Um, fun fact, she recites one of her poems. Uh, yeah, I know, right? Uh, Medea. There, there's some elements there. If you watch uh, Medea, uh, House of the Family Reunion, and you watch Sanford and Son, uh, you have a really good idea of, um, <laughs> of what our household was like. It was, I'm not going to say, you know, just because it was scary doesn't mean it wasn't a blast. I mean, I wouldn't change one thing that we have. There's one thing I would change. I wouldn't change the beatings, I wouldn't change the fear, I wouldn't change the people trying to uh, sexually molest me and all that stuff. I would change the one incident that happened in the chapter Snaggletooth Bastard. But the one thing that I'd change, if I could change anything, was the morning childhood died, the morning that my mother attacked me. That was, that was the thing that changed me forever. The other stuff had an impact for sure, but that's the one where the lights went off and that's where I've had to battle forever because when the person who's supposed to love you the most can't be trusted it makes it really hard to trust in a relationship so I'm always suspicious that you know you're doing something not not cheating or whatever but you're always up to something and it's like really when am I going to get attacked and living that kind of way is really tough so I've had to really work on relationships and communication and that's the reason I got a conflict management master's degree so I could work through how to communicate but my Angelo was an accident uh, she was fantastic. I only met her the one time, but we had some student protests that were taking place at Denison University over a racial incident that happened to one of my good friends, Aaron. And um, we were protesting, and I had, during the protest, sorry, during the protest, I had sat, um, I was in an English class, creative writing with Tony Stoneburner, and somehow I came up, and I started talking about my experience with Mama Green, because nobody knew that I was raised in an African-American family. I was deeply ingratiated in the Black Student Union. I mean, I was a family member with them. I actually belonged to a group of 11 African-American guys, and I was the only European guy. Um, we were called the family. And, you know, so all these uh, abilities, communication skills, um, to go from class to social class, social class, race, ethnic group, inner city, suburb, whatever, I was always very blessed to be able to just go wherever and, and always fit in. And that was the greatest blessing. That's, if you want to go back to Emily's question, the three queens gave me the ability to interact with anybody at any time in any way. And that's something that, uh, for me, I think is almost irreplaceable. And so, I started talking about this in class. And everyone was like, are you serious? And I started talking, and they're like, really? And so I spoke for the whole freaking class period. And they start firing questions, because they just, they were, they were like, in disbelief that all these things could happen to a Denison student, right? And so, um, when the protests were going on, I grabbed the microphone. You know, you got Time and Newsweek and all the major networks on campus because we were a very, you know, um, elite school. And so, top 50 in the nation, and they'd already been out uh, at Brown University uh, protesting the same thing. So, the news is going all over, and I, I do a speech in front of 1,500 people, grab the microphone, and I tell the story. And my my roommates didn't even know it. They're out there crying. They're like, well, I didn't know. I said, well, I don't need to talk about it. Um, you know, my, my roommate knew because he came back and met Mama Green, and both of them loved her. Her food was fantastic. 
you can ask Tony Dorman to this day or Duke. They, they'll tell you her her food was off the chain, remarkable. As a matter of fact, I'm getting a little hungry thinking about it. But in any case, that's neither here nor there. So when I after I give that speech, um, Lisa Coleman, who later she's a good friend of mine, later became the chief diversity officer at Harvard. Now as a chief diversity officer at NYU in New York, um, she invited my Angelo to, to campus, and <clears throat> Dr. Stoneburner was the he was the um, the faculty representative. So he says, Sean, you know, um, my Angelo's coming to campus. Would you like to go? And I said, Yeah, I'm like, sure. Because now every time there's a special guest on campus, I'm being invited. I'm like, I'm not being invited. I'm just a regular guy. But actually, my light was starting to shine because I was teaching at that time. I was teaching as a senior in college. I was lecturing in classes, and I was lecturing all over the place. Every day, well, about once a week, I'm lecturing. So I delivered about 30 lectures, um, and I graded, and I was you know, group leader and stuff like that. I was actually teaching classes as a professor. And so I wasn't paid, though. But I was, Well, I actually was paid as a, as a university fellow, which is like you know, a selected type of thing. And so... Um, Lisa goes, yeah, come on, so let's go. I said, all right. I'm, I didn't know who she was. <laughs> I didn't know who my Angelo was. Because I'm over here reading for my senior thesis, The Institutionalization of Urban Basketball and Cocaine Addiction in the NBA, which was a 270-page um, senior thesis that I wrote my senior year in college. I'm dedicating all my time to that thing, writing this huge thesis, and I'm not reading other stuff. I said, okay, where's the roast dinner? They go, it's at Buxton. I said, Buxton? I said, that's a five-star restaurant. I've never been to the Bucks, and I've been here four years. I can't afford it. I said, yeah, I'm going. So I go down the hill, and uh, we go to the restaurant. Yeah, I had nice clothes and stuff. I'm, I didn't dress like this. I mean, I dressed up. I should be more respectful and dress up for you, but, you know, it's hot in here. And, but anyhow, so we go in there, and I'm sitting there. She's sitting to my right, and Lisa's sitting right to my left, and Tony's sitting over on the other side, and there are about three other students there. And she's mesmerizing. Oh, my God, Ashley. She was freaking phenomenal, and she's telling these stories, and she's so quiet and demure, and I'm like, Lisa, who is this? And she goes, my Angelo fool. I said, I know that. I said, but she meant poet, actress, dancer, the director, professor. I said, ooh. I said, she's incredible. She said, I know. That's why I invited you to come down. I said, oh, okay. And at that point, Dr. Stoneburner goes, uh, Sean. He was very eccentric. Yes, Sean, um, he grabs a beer. Why don't you share with Miss Angelou a little bit about your story with Mrs. Green? <laughs> no, all right. She said, yeah, please share, please share. So I tell him the story like I'm telling you. And it goes on, and I'm, I said, you don't want to hear all that. She said, no, please continue. So I told her a lot of the story, you know, how she, Mom Green grew up a sharecropper. She was a beautiful bare knuckle boxer played the piano and of course my Angela knew about all this right I know why the cage bird sings so it resonated with her her personal background and she just sat back in her chair and she looked at me like this and she said Mr. Schwanner I said yes all right did she call me Mr. Schwanner she said Sean she said Sean I think you should write a book about Mrs. Green I think it'd be a good book I said you think so she goes oh yes I said okay I will so that was 1998, so in 2016, I'm walking down the street, and I'm in total despair, and I said, you know, I threw my hands up to God, I said, God, you got to lead the way, because I can't do it myself anymore, and so when I leaned on God, and I walked in the door, all I could think of was Mama Green saying, you got a million dollar personality, never let anyone take it away, and I said, man, that's pretty powerful, even to this day, I'm still living with that. And so, all these quotations, never trust a snaggletooth bastard, you know, never hate, never judge. All these things start flowing through, so I take my tape recorder out, and I list 187 quotations from hers. And I put them down on a piece of paper, and I said, it's time to write. I said, Mama Green's going to save my life again. So I wrote the book, and I did it to, to let the demons out. It's all in there. And if you read semicolon, I don't have any secrets, baby. I'm totally public. And it's scary. It's so scary to be totally in the public, right? Um, because you don't know who's going to attack you uh, based upon what you wrote. 
and fortunately I haven't been attacked. I've had a few people raise questions, um, but there's no, nothing significant. But no, whoever asked the question was a therapeutic. It was not therapeutic. Um, I was glad to get it out there. It helped me unravel a lot of the messages that were going on in here so I could see things straight. And as a matter of fact, um, my company, Hope Works, is an outcome of that book. It, it's also, the, 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 the mother company is called Greener Day Living, based upon Mama Green, Greener Day. And then Hope Works is based upon the idea that I always think that as long as you have hope, it can work to your advantage. And all that came from the book. But it was painful, baby. Mm-mm. Don't think for a moment. Mm-mm. Well, I'll tell you what, that's, that's when the dam broke. That's when I started to cry. When I couldn't go see Daddy Green in the hospital, you know, because every time that I, said, I told Mama Green to go tell him that I said hi, and she told me that his eyes would flutter and try to open so he could see me, I figured that when I was eight years old that I could save his life. All I had to do was get into the hospital room, and my mother wouldn't let me go because he's on tubes. They didn't want me to see the tubes in him, right? So I'm not worried about them. I want to see Daddy Green. And finally, on a Friday, they said the nurses and doctors had given me permission to go up and see him, but my mom wouldn't let me go because I didn't have a new coat. <laughs> Fucking coat. And she said, I'll get you a coat this weekend and you can go up on Monday. Well, Saturday, my friend from school was the first friend I ever had at home because we're from you know, the ghetto and mom wasn't real big on having, she didn't want to embarrass herself. She was doing great. I mean, she was doing everything she could possibly do. She bought a house so I could have a home. You know, she was sending me to a great private school, but you know, it's a little bit different when everyone lives in the suburb and then you're coming to the inner city and, you know, how, you know, the, the, the paint on the house is chipping off, you know, it's a green, it's not ugly, but it's green and the paint's falling off, the tiles are broke, the sidewalk's all cracked up, you know, weeds here, all the houses are dilapidated up, not all, many of them are dilapidated, many people kept their house up actually extremely nice. So Billy comes over and we're playing and I get a call from Mama Green and she said, baby, I said, yeah, Ma. She said, Daddy's dead. And she said, you got to be the man of the house now. And I'm like, what? She said, Daddy died. And I was like, I put my head on the chair and Billy starts patting me on my back and I refused to cry. I didn't cry. I never cried about it until I wrote the book. And then I couldn't stop crying because I never had a chance to grieve because I had to take care of Mama Green now. Sean, this little itty bitty boy, had to take care of this mountain of strength. And the reversal of those roles meant I had to be stoic. And so I was stoic. And in doing so, um, I lost a little bit of that emotional attachment. Now, I would have never cried over it. I still haven't cried over my father committing suicide. You know, um, it hurt me. I mean, I threw up a nasty message that I found out later. Was, I think it was an accidental death, but I can't prove it. But my Angelo, she saw the, the beauty in this story of this little white baby who was going to be d disposed of being saved by an African-American woman who was raised an abused sharecropper in Arkansas, right? And she said, you know, the fact that in her darkest moment she could shine light on this little boy and raise him to become a, well, I wasn't a professor then, but a college student, it's a magnificent story. And, oh my God, wait till you see the movie, because I'm writing the movie, right? I'm, I'm in the process of writing up the movie. And, oh, oh. Wait till you see the ending of it. You gotta see it, right? You're gonna see it. So the ending of it is, I'm not gonna tell you. I'm not gonna tell you. It's, it's gonna be fan. You're gonna cry, boy. When you go see that movie, you better believe you're gonna cry. And Albany, the ending of the movie is the beginning of the book. It all ties back in a circle, just like hope, right? Every time it ties back in a circle, you get broken, 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 and you're sitting here in pieces, right? But as long as you have hope to pull it all back together, you can always find the people for your team. You can always read and improve your mind. You can always keep moving forward. You can always sit down and say, you know what, I need a plan. I need to sit down and make a plan and execute this plan. I need to have better people in my life. I need to have, I, if I'm the average of the five people that surround me all the time, then I need to increase the average, don't I? Right? Because I know that if, I, if you give me the income level or you give me the financial stability of the five people closest, especially the ten, you give me all those people, let me see their bank accounts, I know how much you're going to have in your bank account. And the other thing I'm going to know, let me go, go through your trash. You let me go through your trash and pull out what's in there. I'll, I'll know everything about you. I'll know all your habits. I'll know how you eat. I'll know how you spend. I'll know what you do. And I can tell you 
once I see your trash and once I see your 10 closest friends, I'll be able to tell you almost to the dime how much money you have in the bank. I'll, I'll be able to tell you almost how happy you are based upon those kind of things, right? So if you have hope, though, you can make modifications and then walk forward. And how do I know you can continue to make modifications? Because, my God, when you're lying in a puddle of blood and you think, you know, you, you just survived getting killed and then you decide you want to kill yourself, if you can get up from that, you can get up from anything, baby. That's just the way it is. If you can live a petrified life and still manage to get a college degree and then go get a PhD and then teach 20,000 people, if I can get up off that floor from being knocked unconscious several times, right, from being beat up by a street gang, from having having a guy on my uh, uh, strikeout team put a knife to my throat and say, I could kill you right now. I say, yeah, you could, but I'm up next. And then, you know, and then having a street gang uh, surround me with this pretty girl and I have a brand new bike and I got 10, 16 guys surrounding us. They're about ready to take care of us and figure out a way to get out of the situation. You can come through those kind of things. You can do anything, baby. So the reason I tell these stories to you is I know many of you have struggles, but it's here to tell you that even through your struggles, you find great strength. And right now, and here's what I always live by, right now, there's somebody being born who needs you. All these pains, all these things that you've experienced, they're being born and they need your guidance, they will need your pain, they will need you to shine your light upon them. Right? That's what hope is. Once you have the hope, you can build the process, but with hope, you can share it and you can shine it on other people and as long as you do that this world can always be a better place never hate never judge and let me tell you what if you hate people because without even knowing them if you're judging people without even knowing them based upon arbitrary distinctions of sexual preference you know country of origin a race ethnicity social class if you if you dislike people just based upon surface things you're gonna live a long miserable life you know why because while you're judging them they're judging you and you're always assuming that they're judging you and you have this little thing going on inside you that is just slightly, uh, sorry about that, is um, built upon a little bit of anger. And that anger is where the distance comes from. By the way, some of the greatest anger that you're ever, ever going to experience is in your personal relationships. That's why the communication is so important. If I've learned anything in this life, you got to communicate. you got to communicate because the reason why couples break up is because of the communication component of it. It can be... Your story. Oh, thank you, Jessica. I mean, I'm rolling down here. Emily, it can be so hard to unlearn those defense mechanisms. Let me tell you what. Unlearning defense mechanisms takes a lot of, not just communication with other people. There's a thing called self-talk. And self-talk requires that you learn how to talk to yourself in a better way. I'm putting up all these things on my wall. A setback is a setup for a comeback. Right? I'm starting to put the sayings back up on my wall because, you know, when I have certain, like, uh, thinking processes, I want to bring something positive in. You know, over here, I like you. I mean, on my refrigerator. Every morning when I go to make my breakfast, I read the sign that says, fill a stadium, my ultimate goal, and then it has, how am I going to get there? I love you, I like you, and you're worthy of your dreams. I'd say, I say that to myself every day because the messages can be different. Like, can be different. Now, for you, right, it's the same thing. It's exactly the same thing. If you can love yourself like yourself, and realize you're worthy of your dreams, you're always in a position to help other people make their life better. You're always in a position to make your life better. And if you never give up hope, let me tell you something, baby. You're stronger than 95% of the population. If you have hope, and if you have the ability to analyze the, the trends and the roads in front of you, and if you have the ability to come up with a plan and build your team, then you can execute. So it's basically five steps. You take those five steps, Baby, you're golden. You're golden. And as far as I'm concerned, every last one of you, I've seen your work. I haven't read it yet, so I'm sorry. But I've seen your work, and I know what you're capable of. I know what your thinking is. And I know all of you have the ability to find your greatness. And the thing is, every one of you have it. All of you have it. It's just a matter of uncovering it, believing it, finding it, and making it happen. Right? So... You know, that's the, way, that's the way I look at it. It's hard to unlearn it, but it can be unlearned. It's called, there's a process. It's called socialization, which is what we, how we learn everything. Desocialization is where we strip it off and re-socializing into a new way of thinking. And let me tell you, if you begin to think that you are worthy of all your dreams, great things will happen. Let me see here. 
I'm glad you're able to overcome everything life had thrown at you. Became such a strong oh, Angelica. I wasn't ready for all that. Come on, man. Thank you. I appreciate it though. Uh, I don't see myself as so strong. I do and I don't. Um, I definitely don't see the inspiration. I get it. I, I do and I don't. Um, however, I do know that um, when I tell a story, I know that people can connect to it because they go through their own thing. And if they see that someone like myself, poor inner city kid who was raised in an African American family, can come through it, then anybody can. And you know, that's that's a pretty that's a pretty important message, right? But I do appre I appreciate you all. You're all so supportive of me. Okay, and Angelica, here we go. Aguiar, Aguiar, is that does that mean eagle? Okay, I think it does. Ever since that one night your mom tried to end your life, you live in fear of her from there on? Um, I lived in fear before then. After that, I never lived in fear again. Because when, when those tacks were laid out on the floor, and I stepped on the tack with my right foot, and it kind of penetrated, but it didn't go all the way in. It was in my foot, but the tacks were all over the bedroom floor because she had thrown the bookcase down and all my games and books and clothes, everything was flipped over in my bedroom. And there are all these tacks, because I had a um, little shot glass filled with tacks to put up on my little cork board, because I had all these messages and stuff on my cork board. And so all these tacks were all over the floor, and what she said was, she said, um, I looked down, and she pushed me, and I was, I, she said, walk on those tacks. Damn it, I want you to walk on them. I'm like, no, I'm not at this point, because I could take her physically. I mean, I was older than I was 15, but I was always taught, always respect your mother under all circumstances. But when that, when I stepped down on that tack, and that tack went into my heel, I said, I'm not walking on these tacks. So I did a spin move, a pivot, right, as if I'm playing basketball on my left foot. Came back around, and I looked at her straight in the face. I said, Mom, you make me walk on those tacks. One of us is going to die in this house today. I don't know if it's going to be you or me, but someone's going to die. She stopped. She walked out of the house. She went to the kitchen door and she goes, you better clean this house up. She said much worse, worse words than that, but you better clean this house. And she left and I laid down on the kitchen floor. The shirt that I was wearing had been shredded by her fingernails where she gouged a, a, a channel, a canal into my back and when she did that the blood was just rolling down my back and I just laid there on the floor and I, I looked up and said am I really worthy of life my mother doesn't want me she clearly showed that today and I'm laying I said no you deserve life call mama so I called mama green she came over to the house and she dropped her, and she had her gun in her hand. She raised it up towards the ceiling, and she goes, Oh, Lord, my baby. This can't be happening to my baby. And she drops to her knees. She said, I'm going to kill her. I'm going to kill her. I said, Ma, you can't kill my mother. Because then I don't have a mother, and I don't have you. And I said, I need you in my life. I said, just help me clean. Just help me clean. And so we cleaned the house up. And when my mom came home, Mama Green walked straight up to her, put the gun right in her, up to, to her head. If you ever touch him again, I will kill you. She goes, baby, let's go. Got in the car and we went back over to her house. My mom's crying. I didn't mean it. I'm so sorry. That was the most important day of my life. Because at that point, there was nothing my mother could do to me to harm me again. Nothing. And I just walked away and said, it'll never happen again. And I knew if it did, she was going to die because Mama Green was going to kill her. And so at that point, it became a whole nother, it became a whole nother story. I had to unravel a lot of bad messages in my head. Um, it was really hard to go to that private school after that because I couldn't even change my clothes to go to gym class for a week. And I showed the teacher, Al Getman, what had happened. I, I didn't know who to turn to. So I told him, I said, oh, I, I, you know, my grades are going to suffer. I, I don't want to lose. I don't want to, you know, lose my opportunity to stay in this school. 
said, Ross, what's wrong, Shawnee? What's wrong? And I showed them. Because they all knew, and I've talked to the teachers since. They said, we knew something was up. We just didn't know what it was. We knew something was wrong. And I showed him my back. And he called an emergency faculty meeting and met with all the teachers in the high school and said, we got to save this boy. Because what he's going through, we can't even imagine. So those teachers rallied together so that I could get through this school. Because it was it, my high school was a lot harder than college was, trust that. And so they rallied so I could get through it. And at that point, I was like, there is nothing, sorry. I said, there is nothing that my mother can do to harm me. It's over. And it took five to ten years of us actively trying to fix and mend the wall for us to actually become mother and son again. And every once in a while it would creep in. But she made some significant changes in her life and attitude um, after she had got married to my stepfather which was a very interesting story in and of itself but after he died I was the only thing she had left I was the only person and so she and I spent a lot of time mending that wall and actually became best friends so and I always knew she was brilliant I always knew she was loving she was a caring she was a caring soul fantastic nurse, brilliant mind. Her outbursts were just based upon the fact that she had been so brutally beaten as a kid. And when that gets triggered from PTSD, it's unstoppable. And so she was able to fight through those demons. And when she finally fought through those demons, right, she and I were able to be um, mother-son. Um, and then when she died, it was the most blessed probably 10 days, 2 weeks of my life, except that, you know, she, she got one final blow in. I'm not, I can't lie and say she didn't. I said, Mom, this is going to make you cry. I said, Mom, two days before she died, did I make you proud? She said, no. And that was it. I was like, oh, great. You got me with that one. I said, okay, well, I'll try to do better. And then two days later, she had passed away. But aside from that, I never again lived in fear. Not, not of her and as a matter of fact I have fears but I don't live in fear right I'm not I'm not fearful of death because I looked at it several times or incidents where I could have died many times um, some of them self-provoked right walking up on a wall 75 feet high that's only about this thick the wind blows and I was in Cincinnati wind blows I'm done <laughs> so I'm like but as a fatalistic attitude that I developed the, the, the biggest impact on me as far as like risk-taking behavior is that I became very fatalistic because death was always right there on my doorstep and um, going back to Emily's question when you're constantly surrounded with chaos when things start going well um, you want the chaos because you understand it and it's comfortable and so one of my biggest problems has been I create chaos for myself when things are going well that way I just can feel normal so the one thing that I've really worked on is making sure I don't do that anymore. And that was a huge adjustment for me. So I look back on it and um, no, my, my mother never got in trouble because in the 70s you just didn't report that. It was a private matter. Even though it was legal, it was a private matter. But when she bashed me up against the refrigerator like she was swinging a baseball bat and knocked me unconscious and beat me on the stove, I was removed from the house at that point. And um, do I black out now? No, I don't black out um, because I don't have to detach from things around me. I can walk away now. I couldn't walk away back then. And, uh, but I will drink to the point where I forget things just so I don't have to deal with them. But what I've decided is, is that I have to not do that because um, I have so much more things to offer. So I have to retrain my brain, which I've been doing for three or four years. We train my brain on how to process, you know, chaos so I can turn it into healthy outcomes rather than, you know, destructive ones. And the greatest avenue I have is the classroom. And my biggest dislike about teaching literally is grading. If all I had to do is come in and teach, I'd never be discouraged. Man, I'd love it forever. But if I, I'm not big into committee work, um, I won't say why because this is going to be 
public, so I won't say why, but I'm not big on committee work. I hate following bureaucratic rules. I think the rules get in the way of us actually educating students, but if I could just come in and teach, I could do it forever. So that's the reason why I wanted to start my company, Hope Works, so I can be a motivational speaker, because I don't have to grade stuff, but I can deliver the message. And so all these things, what I realized from Bertha was that my job isn't to teach you. My job is to deliver a message that you can use to make your life better. And if I can take that darkness from the past and shine light on your path, then I will have succeeded. If I can do that, then the three queens, my mom, Irma Jean, and Mama Green, Daddy Green guy, they too will have succeeded because they were taking this little kid out of the ashes and the rubble, raised him up to be a grown man, and then learn how to shine that light on others. And my mom always told me I had light. She always said that I was a change maker. And she said, don't ever think differently. And so they all did. All three of them. They were, that's the one thing they said. They, they said, you have a special gift. Share it. Well, I didn't know that the special gift really was using the darkness to find the light and then shine it on others. And by shining it on others, it gives you the opportunity to say to yourself, that your life is worthy of light and not dark. And if you shine your light, it gives you the, the freedom to express life as you should live it. Right? So, last thing. Know your passions. Know the trends. And don't be afraid to build a beautiful life. Because at the end of the day, you deserve it. And the beautiful life will come once you realize that you have greatness inside of you. And it is your job create the team and the mindset so that your greatness can breathe through because you will have the ability to impact other people in ways that you can't imagine. And at the end of the day, we're social creatures, right? That's what social environment's about. We are social creatures. So if you can impact the world in a positive way, baby, you've actualized yourself. And that's the hardest thing to do. So I hope that uh, you found this relatively interesting today. Uh, for me, it's, a, it's always a, like one of those uh, dual-edged swords. On the one hand, it's like I know it's important to share. On the other hand, you know, i got to go through all that pain again and visualizing that stuff. Um, it, it's tough. Rolling down those stairs. <laughs> I can't believe we used to roll down those stairs. If you're ever in my live class, I'll tell you what happened to Joe in the end. Um, she ended up committing suicide, but she gave me one of the worst nightmares I've ever had when she appeared in my my dream hanging in the back of an alley um, the day after she had died. I was in Delray Beach with my grandfather and my mom, and she was up in Toledo, and I didn't, I had no idea, but here she was. It was a, that's a crazy scenario, um, but in any case, I have tons of stories, baby. Um, but at the end of the day, all I know is I'm a messenger. Right? I'm just a vessel, and I was, I literally am a third grade dropout African American woman delivering a message of hope. That's all I do. And hopefully uh, you can pull from it and grow from it and become better from it. And that would mean that all those experiences from my mom, Irma Jean, everybody, wasn't in vain. And if we can do that, it's a great day. I want to wish you a great day. Um, watch the announcement board probably starting Thursday and Friday. I'll be making several announcements. Um, I'll be give, I'm starting the grading process so that you should have all your grades coming up by Sunday. And that way we know next week as we roll out to the end of the semester, we'll know exactly where we stand. Um, do not submit stuff to my, do not submit it to my MDC address, either sean.hopeworks at gmail.com or within bill, billboard, blackboard and then everything will be good. All right, I hope you like it when it comes out. I hope you share it. I hope it was worth um, reading and hearing these stories. And I just want to say bless you. Thank you for everything. You all are very supportive. Uh, I look forward to meeting you someday. And um, 